My name is John Passfield, and the title of this reading will be The Poetic Novel 1, Video 11, F. Scott Fitzgerald. This is my book. Let me hold it up here. The Poetic Novel 1, Influences and Elements by John Passfield. Three roses. A rose is a rose is a rose, said Gertrude Stein when talking about imagery. So I put that on the cover. Now, it's not a published book. Uh, but it can be accessed for free on my website, johnpassfield.ca. Uh, I'm going to read from a chapter in this book in which I discuss the contribution to my writing career of F. Scott Fitzgerald, and in particular his novel, The Great Gatsby. So here's a book that I used to teach when I was a high school teacher, The Great Gatsby, my name is on there, as you can see, just so I didn't get it mixed up with other student copies, because I underline and put stars in the margin and so on, so I can find things when we're chatting during classes. Okay, so The Great Gatsby. The essay has 14 sections. In this video, I'm going to read the first two sections and then read part of the final section as a conclusion. As mentioned, the complete essay can be found on my website, johnpassfield.ca, J-O-H-N-P-A-S-S-F-I-E-L-D.ca. Okay, note 11 in the book, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Here's a quote, but it's a quote from one of my other books, one of my notebooks. The image at the end of a novel which lifts the whole novel onto a higher plane than has been apparent to the reader, find the quotation. That's a note from me to me. Find that F. Scott Fitzgerald quotation that you've been referring to for so many years in your notebooks. The image at the end of a novel, which lifts the whole novel onto a higher plane than has been apparent to the reader, find a quotation. So I'll talk about that as I read. But you get to the end of a novel and you think, oh, yeah, the novel's about this and that. But then there's an image there. And you think, oh, I, I can look at the whole novel again in a different way and see more in it than I saw before because this image has been placed near the end. That's the point. Okay, here's me reading from the essay. This passage is from a note which I wrote to myself under the heading of F. Scott Fitzgerald when I roughed out a plan for this book, The Poetic Novel, a few years ago. Recently, after writing many times over many years about a comment which F. Scott Fitzgerald made to Ernest Hemingway, I've finally come across a letter on which I assume I originally drew for this technical thematic conception the words that Scott Fitzgerald actually wrote. It's in a book, A Life in Letters, F. Scott Fitzgerald, which is edited by Matthew J. Broccoli. The pertinent passage, pertinent passage dated June 1929, is from a letter from F. Scott Fitzgerald to Ernest Hemingway concerning the typescript of Hemingway's just-completed novel, A Farewell to Arms. Now, here's what Fitzgerald wrote. Page 241 is one of the best pages you've ever written, I think. Why not end the book with that wonderful paragraph on page 241? It is the most eloquent in the book and would end it rather gently and well. A beautiful book it is. Okay, we'll get to that quote in a minute. In the margin of this letter is, scrib is a scribbled note from Hemingway, Kiss My Ass, E.H., Ernest Hemingway. He didn't like the advice. Okay, Broccoli's note about the above reads. Chapter 34, pages 266-67, which would be in the published version of Hemingway's novel. Frederick Henry's night soliloquy after his reunion with Catherine at Stressa. If people bring so much courage to the world, the world has to kill them to break them. So, of course, it kills them. That's the quote that Scott Fitzgerald thought was perfect and should be moved to the end of the book rather than where it ended up. Fitzgerald wrote in the margin of the typescript, says Broccoli, this is one of the most beautiful pages in all English literature. The note was erased, but it's still readable. So uh, what Hemingway wrote is uh, erased, but still readable. I kiss my ass, Ernest Hemingway. The note that Fitzgerald wrote, this is me read, writing now, the note that Fitzgerald wrote is a surprise to me and somewhat of a disappointment to me, as I've been referring to it for the 20 years in which I've been writing my planning notebooks and journals as a key concept in my own theory of novel writing. Now it seems that Fitzgerald might not have meant what I've always taken him to mean, so my theory might well have come from another Fitzgerald comment 
from some other writer or be original with me. So it sounds like he's just saying it'd be a good way to end this particular novel. I thought of it over the years as this is the way to change our view of the whole novel by adding one image near the end, which energizes every image that's come before it. That was my theory. Okay, here's the second section of this essay. In any case, here is the theory that was inspired by the Fitzgerald Comet above, which was read by me probably 40 to 50 years ago in my 20s. In all those years, I remembered that Fitzgerald's example was the passage from a farewell to arms that people bring so much courage to the world. But I've always felt that the best example of a Fitzgerald concept was a passage in his own writings. The Fitzgerald passage which I saw as illustrating this concept has always been the passage about the green breast of the new world from the great Gatsby. Let me just turn my corner here, corner of the page. Okay, here's the quote from the great Gatsby. Gradually, I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. It's vanished trees. The trees that had made way for Gatsby's house had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent. That's the North American continent. Compelled into an aesthetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history, was something commensurate with his capacity for wonder. So that's the passage from the Great Gatsby. So the Dutch sailors looked on the new world, and their dreams were as big as mankind can possibly dream. But for once, they saw something physical that was big enough to allow those dreams to come true. What was it? It was the whole of North America. And, says the passage, there's nothing in the world now that you could look at that seems as if it would allow you to fulfill the highest possible dreams that mankind can imagine. So that's a beautiful passage. What it does is it energizes everything that's come in the novel before it. Here's uh, how I explain that. So the reader's question, having read The Great Gatsby so far, and now reading this passage is, what did Dutch sailors have to do with the story of Gatsby and Daisy and Tom and Nick? The green breast of the New World passage is deepening imagery. It juxtaposes Dutch sailor imagery with 1920s bootlegging imagery. What? How do they go together? What is unprinted when imagery is juxtaposed, put side by side, is the thematic energy that leaps between the disparately seeming images. It is this thematic glue which the reader is being invited to supply. So the novel shouldn't really tell you what Dutch sailors have to do with 1920s bootleggers. The reader supplies that. You're the one who energizes the imagery. You, the reader. Now, can we say that imagery of the Great Gatsby is given over entirely to the reader, as is the imagery of the wasteland? We can ask. Number one, there's three points here. Does the image begin and end with, gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, the fresh green breast of the new world, its vanished trees, the trees that made the way for Gatsby's house? That's a question left to the reader. Number two. Does the interpretation of a character, Nick Carraway, take up the rest of the quoted passage? Does Nick Carraway tell you what it means? Three, is the character Nick Carraway an author's spokesman, or is his interpretation dramatic in that this or other imagery in the novel might agree with, modify, or deny Nick's interpretation of the green breast image? So is the novel bigger than Nick Carraway? Does it ask you to do more thinking than Nick Carraway asks you to do? Maybe he's telling you something. Maybe you're saying, no, Nick, I'm smarter than you. I do more thinking than you. I can see more in The Great Gatsby, the novel, than you. And further with the above questions considered, is The Great Gatsby richer or poorer for having a character as a narrator? Do we really want someone to tell us what the novel means, a character inside the novel, or do we want to do our own thinking? 
Number two, the next comments on the imagery of the green breast open the imagery up to a reader's interpretation or confine the reader to Nick's interpretation. Don't let your mind wander, the book might say. Just listen to Nick, you know, and be satisfied with that. If so, ah, oh, gee, that's too bad. Makes the book smaller. Do we rethink Nick's interpretation in order to move past it in a quest for the author's interpretation? Do we do more thinking than Nick is capable of? Okay. So in The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, comparing two books here, we have, there's one, two, three, four, five, six points here in dashes. Here they are. Number one, no identifiable main character who goes through an experience. Number two, a consciousness who is considering a heap of broken images for significance and placement. Number three, this consciousness does not comment on his or her interpretation of the imagery. There's no character in The Wasteland that interprets it for us. Four, no narrator who selects and interprets imagery. Five, an author who presents every word of the poem as his objective correlative. Six, a reader who is invited to respond to the wasteland as an interpreter of imagery. So you get a lot less help when you read the wasteland than you do when you read The Great Gatsby. Okay, as a comparison, in The Great Gatsby we have, here's I think four points. Number one, a main character, Gatsby, who goes through an experience, sometimes comments on it, but is mainly what I would call dramatic, meaning because mainly uninterpretive. Gatsby doesn't say a lot. You have to ask yourself what he's thinking. Asking him doesn't do any good. Number two, a main character who is a narrator, Nick, who selects certain imagery to present to a reader and who sometimes interprets this imagery. <coughs> Excuse me. Three, an author who presents every word of a novel as his objective correlative. Four, a reader who's invited to respond to the Great Gatsby as an interpreter of imagery. So you're still asked to interpret the Great Gatsby, but you have people in the novel who interpret it, which is a little different than the Wasteland. Okay. In a sense, I've set my own technical thematic conception of the poetic novel closer to the technique of the Wasteland than to that of the Great Gatsby. So it's not right or wrong. It's just a choice, and I've made a choice. Okay. So... These are the first two of 14 segments of this essay, the essay in my book, all in pursuit of the question what makes some novels poetic and other novels unpoetic. And here's part of the final segment of my Fitzgerald essay. <clears throat> so I'm leaving it odd out, but I'm reading the conclusion. At any rate, whatever the meaning to an individual reader, the great Gatsby does what Shakespeare did so well. And what such critics as Una Ellis Firmer say that all great literature does. It finds a technical means of presenting both the prose surface and the image depths of the lives of the main characters on the surface of the play or the novel so viewers and readers can see what is happening in the depths of the consciousness of each of the main characters. The Great Gatsby is a touchstone novel for me, John Passfield, and it is only recently that I've been able to relate the novel to my own theories of literary works as instruments of perception and communication. That's what a book is, a book of fiction. It's an instrument of perception and communication. Some critics have said that The Great Gatsby has grown in stature as time has gone by. I would say... That is because each of us as a reader is able to respond to its imagery, as does Nick, in ways that expand our own mind's ability to think. That is why the great works of literature invite and reward repeated readings. Great books expand our ability to think. And now here's a note that I wrote for this video presentation. Everything I've read so far was from that book, The Poetic Novel. Biographers tell us that F. Scott Fitzgerald read Heart of Darkness by Conrad before he wrote The Great Gatsby. It was much influenced by this novella. One could look at the two books and say that there's really no connection between them at all. One set in Africa in the 19th century, and the other set in America in the 1920s. Excuse me. <clears throat> or one could say, as many have, that the similarity between the two is that the information of the story comes to the reader in small doses, that each book is a puzzle that the reader solves by learning incrementally about the life of the main character. 
I think, though, that the most fascinating thing about the two books is that in each case, the reader does not read the thoughts of the main character, Kurtz in Heart of Darkness and Gatsby in The Great Gatsby, but reads the imagery by which the main character thinks. In Great Gatsby, we have such images as the little white roadster, in which the young Gatsby and the young Daisy sit and talk about their future. The judge's mansion in which Daisy lives, and in which Gatsby is a temporary visitor. The mansion which Gatsby buys when he becomes rich. The green light on Daisy's dock. The parties which Gatsby throws and then suddenly stops throwing. The 1919 World Series, and so many more images. The point that I'm making is that we don't know what Gatsby's thinking about these images. What we have in both books is another main character who does the thinking as these images come to him incrementally, bit by bit. In Heart of Darkness, Marlowe considers all the images that he assumes are in the mind of Kurtz and tries to figure out what they might mean to Kurtz. In Great Gatsby, Nick Carraway considers all the images that he assumes are operating in the mind of Gatsby and tries to figure out what they might mean to Gatsby. So what this means is that the author, Conrad in one case and Fitzgerald in the other, is not telling the reader what the novel means, but is asking the reader what the novel means. The author is providing the imagery with which the reader can think, but is not imposing interpretive thought on the reader. These books, Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad and The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, are not prose novels. They are poetic novels that both books invite, even demand, the active participation of the reader as a reason that they are still being read to this day. So this is my book. It's uh, The Poetic Novel, One Influences and Elements by John Passfield. It can be found on my website, johnpassfield.ca, if you're interested in this kind of thought about books and literature. Lastly, I'll just say thank you for watching this video.